go Falcons. As I told you before, we never really take you out of class and gather you in this room unless something really important. And today's certainly no exception. It's been about 15 months since we lost Jake. It's been, I think, nine months since we lost Kevin. And obviously that weighs heavy on the minds of many. And since these guys were friends of yours and your age, here at Seniors in the auditorium, and for all the students throughout the school, uh, we know that uh, you're under a lot of pressure. And there's a lot that you deal with. So today, what we hope, you're gonna hear a, a, an amazing message of hope that will help you through times when you're really, really down. Um, to start us off, I'd like to introduce Jim Cutso, Kevin's dad, who will be introducing our speaker for today. So a round of applause. seen with someone pulling at over to help because they remember Kevin sprinting down the roadside to tend to a hurting man. His afterglow will be seen in a student who did a portrait of Kevin's yearbook photo and gave it to us as a gift. His afterglow will be seen in a group of students who chose to start a nonprofit and donate the proceeds to Will to Live. His afterglow will be seen in a community, when a high school football stadium chants, we love Kevin. His afterglow will be seen when childhood friends embrace one town and can be rivals instead of enemies. And I have this picture here today. Is Greg Cogman here? <coughs> Hammer, how you doing, my friend? Yeah, how are you? <laughs> so Greg and Kevin were very good friends. And this is after a board of the football game. And here these two best friends are walking out side by side in their love though and you've been worn uniforms. But they didn't care. They, they were friends and they realized that there are some things bigger than a than a rival. I love you, man. Kevin's afterglow will be seen when each of us loves a little harder, cares a little deeper, and holds a little tighter. And we can honor Kevin by spreading that afterglow. In April, SCI 
Act Commissioner of Ward AD, Dave Schultz, had asked me if I ever heard of John Trautmann, and I hadn't. So I did like anyone else, I Googled him. I found the Will to Live website and watched his speaking engagements. There were too many similarities between John's family and mine. Will Trautmann, John's son, and Kevin played the cross. John speaking to student athletes and my background with youth, with youth sports. How many kids have I coached here on the cross? And how many kids have played, uh, how many boys and girls have played Fairfield Youth Lacrosse in their, in their time here? Awesome, awesome. My grandfather founded the FCAC, and my father was a commissioner of the FCAC for 38 years. And here the FCAC is adopting the Life Teammates Program by the Will to Live organization. I have found a purpose in the way I can deliver the message of mental health awareness and suicide prevention. But most of all, I found hope and support from John, a total stranger who called me to let me know that he was 10 years out from his son Will taking his life, and that if he could do it, I could survive too. You see, it's those little things that you can do to make a difference in someone's life. So without further ado, I would like to introduce a man who has been an inspiration and a mentor to me. So let's give a big fearful welcome to John Trapper. So guys, it's a pleasure to be here. I was, I was here in Fairfield two years ago, and um, I was brought here by a couple of my very, very close friends that I went to college with and played college baseball with. So life teammates of my own brought me here to, to, to bring this message of, of hope. And what I'm gonna try to do over the next 40, 45 minutes or so is I'm gonna challenge you all to really think about the relationships in your life. And really think about those people that you care so much about. And I hope that by the time I'm done, I hope that tonight, when you look at yourselves in the mirror, you'll, you'll see somebody slightly different. You'll see somebody who understands just how much power they have to deliver hope to their friends. And, and I'm going to try to, to uh, give you this message through, through my story and my family's story which is not unlike the story you just heard. But I will tell you, it is a story that, that began in tragedy, but is filled with such hope, and such motivation, and such inspiration, that it actually changed my life in a way that I never expected to happen. So I'll first just start by introducing my family. So my wife, Susie, and, and our four kids, Will and Tommy, Michael and Holland, we live uh, just outside of Atlanta. We've been there about 22, 24 years. I'm from the Chicago area. Originally, I went to Northwestern University uh, with my two buddies that are here today that brought me to Fairfield. Um, I played baseball there. And uh, after my baseball career was over, um, and after my college career was over, I had the, the honor to, an opportunity to play professional baseball. And I spent seven years in, in the pro ball ranks most of those were with the Montreal Expos, and that shows you how old I am. They don't exist anymore. Um, and most of those were in the minor leagues. But I did have one year, a very fun year, where I got to spend uh, 1988 in the major leagues with the Boston Red Sox. And um, through that time, guys, I had so many teammates. And it wasn't just my teammates from my Red Sox days or my Expos days. It was my teammates from my from my college days in Northwestern, my teammates from Barrington High School outside of Chicago, my teammates from Little League. They were there for me. They delivered hope for me. They loved me, and in so many ways, they, they saved me. 
And you see the picture on the far, far left of the screen is my wife Susie, who's probably the real athlete in the family. She played lacrosse and field hockey for the University of Virginia. So again, lots of teammates. Lots of teammates that helped her, that loved her, and that also were there for her in times of need. So we had a very teammate approach to our parenting. Good teams win, great teams love each other. My kids heard every cliche out there about the importance of being a good teammate. And we had fun, we have a fun home, a happy home, a loving home. My marriage is very, very strong. My wife is nuts about me. <laughs> I'm nuts about her. Happy, positive. If you ask the, the people in our neighborhood about the trout wines, they would say, yeah, they've got it going. I work for an IT company in, in, in Atlanta. I've been doing that for a long time. I'm a chief customer officer, so I do a lot of sales and marketing. Um, we live a good life. We live a happy life. We're living the dream, and people would have told you that about the trout wines, that they're living the dream. But a story that you're all too familiar with, Kevin and Jake happened to us in October of 2015 when we lost a loved one. And I don't care how you lose a loved one, when you lose a loved one, your life changes. Will was 15, he was a freshman in high school. He was big, he was strong, he was handsome, he was healthy, he was popular, he had an army of friends. He was a good athlete, he was a good student. He was a very, very accomplished musician. He had a band. He was the lead singer. He wrote songs. It was eighth grade graduation. He played live for his screaming friends. He had an army of friends, and it was so much fun to see. We lost him. And I remember just thinking, how can a boy living in my home, how can a boy with, with our loving home lose the will to live? Who knows how long I've loved you You know I love you still Will I wait a lonely lifetime If you want me to, I will For if I We were 
devastated, right? We were just, we were shocked, we were stunned, we, were, we had no idea if it was even wrong. It was a situation where Will was, had, you know, depression is an illness, but it can be a maskable illness. So he didn't know he had it. He certainly didn't want anyone else to think something was wrong. We didn't know he had it. I didn't even know it existed. I knew nothing about it. I thought he was perfect. But that weekend, people were coming up to me out of the blue and saying, oh, my brother, my roommate, my uncle, my aunt, my old neighbor, my old coach, our pastor. They all had a story. It was everywhere. And yet, I had never uttered the word, mentioned the word, talked the word suicide or depression, ever. And that weekend of Will's death, it was everywhere. And everybody had a story. And these wonderful organizations were coming up to me and giving me their cards and counseling and wanting me to come to therapy because, John, this is so common. Guys like Will, this is so common. What do you mean it's so common? Oh, yeah. Every 13 minutes in America, somebody takes their lives. Every two hours, it's a teenager. Every two hours in America, a teenager takes their life. That's a statistic that just people don't talk about. Nobody knows about this. I'm, I'm going to be here for two days. I'm going to give eight speeches. And in those two days, 24 teenagers in America are going to take their life. Why doesn't anyone talk about it? I was just so shocked by this. One in six, actually. Jim, it's now one in five. One in five of you. One in five of you. One in five of your friends, one in five of your family, suffer from some form of diagnosable mental illness. It's everywhere. It's real. But it's also treatable. It's also beatable. It's very, very common. Yeah. It's incurable. It's most importantly, guys, it's OK. It's okay to not be okay. And that's what Will didn't think. He was not okay, but he couldn't tell anybody. He didn't want to tell anybody. And his father never occurred to him that he could be struggling in any way. Because I was uneducated and I was unaware. And I never even had a chance to help him. Even when you have a chance. Mental illness is very, very hard. It's very, very difficult. And talking about it is so important. So I thought during that time, as I was so many things going through my mind, through my how am I going to do this? Right? Maybe if I could find a way to get other kids to talk, to get kids like yourselves to be able to say to somebody, gosh, I'm not okay. How do I get them to do that? And I didn't know how I was going to do it. And then all of a sudden, I'm, I'm giving the eulogy at his funeral. And I'm standing up there, something that we shouldn't have to do. And I did it. And while I was telling Will's friends about the type of kid that Will was, he was one of those kids that truly rejoiced in the success of his friends. He was a good lacrosse player. He didn't care to be a great lacrosse player. And I'm a pretty competitive guy. I got to play in some pretty high levels of sports. And, and I remember saying to him, Will, you could, you could be that guy. He was, I'm good dad. He truly rejoiced in his friends doing well, which is a wonderful trait to have. And as I'm saying this to his friends, I started picking people out in the audience at the church. There was Mark Savard. Mark Savard was, was the other guard on my seventh grade basketball team, have not spoken to him in over 30 years. But when we were 12, we were together every day. There's Jimmy Bartels. He was the first baseman on my Lily team when I was 10. Randy Karen and I played the trumpet together. There's Randy. There's Tick. There's Spike. There's Scooch. There's Mudge. There's all of these friends and teammates that traveled from all over the country in two days' notice to be at the funeral of their buddies son, to be there for their friend who was struggling. And while I was giving this eulogy and I'm picking these guys out, somehow I was able to do this. I was able to still give the speech, but in the back of my mind, I'm looking at these guys that are showing up from nowhere, from my high school football team and baseball teams and basketball team and all these things that I was in. My life friends. It hit me that these were the guys that I learned about life with. These are the guys that I, I went through the trenches with. 
I shared all my firsts with. When I, when I, when I got my, uh, decided where I was going to college, I called them. When I got signed by the Expos, I called them. When I made the big leagues, I called them. When I got engaged, all of my groomsmen in my wedding were there that day at the funeral, coming from all over the country. I'm, I'm in Atlanta now. They were coming from Chicago, they were coming from California, they were coming from Boston, all over the place. And I remember thinking right then and there that these life friends, these life teammates, oh, that's it. These life teammates, the groomsmen to my wedding, the, the godfathers to all of my kids, I met when I was Will's age. It was Kevin's age. It was your age. You guys have already met some of the closest friends you're ever going to have. Oh. Had Will just known that, had Will just known that he had these friends that love him dearly and would want him to have said something, to have called, right? And had Will would have been educated that depression is okay and it is okay to not be okay, maybe he would have done it. So I know what I'm gonna do. I am gonna, I'm gonna create a foundation that teaches kids that true love and true hope, and most importantly, real understanding, is sitting right next to them in this auditorium, and sitting next to them in the sidelines, and, and in the dugout, and in the band, and in the choir, and in the chorus, and in the chess club, and in the youth group, and in the church group, in the scout group, whatever activity you're on, there are peers, there are teammates that are going through these same challenges and obstacles that you are. And if I can get kids to recognize that, I can maybe get them to, to talk a little bit more and improve their relationships. And if I can get them to improve their relationships and their trust in each other and an understanding that they're here for each other, I can increase their will to live. Boom. There's the foundation thing. And we created this will to live foundation and we put, the, we put together these activities that are done for the kids and through the kids and by the kids and they're their ideas and they're not my idea. And they build these bonds while they do it. And they get to understand and they talk to each other. Like you all, they were devastated by the loss, and they didn't know what to do. And this gave them an opportunity to do something together. That was good, that was fun, and created these bonds. And for me, it was eye-opening because I kept getting asked to come speak. I would speak to lacrosse teams, I would speak to FCA groups, I would speak to church groups, and I started to really spend time with the kids. I started to spend time with Will's friends. Real time, quality time, because I was really still investigating how did something like this happen. And what I learned, guys, and this is the most important thing I'm gonna put up here today. What I learned, and what I had never realized, is you have this very hard. It is very difficult to do what you all are doing today. You all have it harder than I did when I was your age. You all have it harder than your parents did when they were your age. You don't hear that very often, do you? I certainly never said that to Will. I was Mr. Positive, I was Mr. Motivational, I was Mr. Isn't this wonderful, isn't this great? I was always going for that Father of the Year award by being upbeat, positive, isn't this great, isn't this awesome, isn't this great, isn't this wonderful? No, Dad, it's not. I'm so strong. I was so powerful in my speaking ability and my personality was so positive that Will never dared say to me, this sucks. Because he knew what he would get from me. How, what do you have to be depressed about? What do you, you kidding me? Look at you, you're big, strong, you're healthy, you got this, you got all these wonderful things, all these things that I never had. What do you kidding me? This is awesome, Will, this is awesome, this is great, you'll be fine. It's all he ever heard from me. All he ever heard from me, isn't this great, isn't this awesome? And not one time in his 15 years did I ever say to him, wow, this is hard. I didn't have to do this. I really regret that. Because while I was saying how awesome it was, the world and society was hitting him hard, like it's hitting you hard. And when I talk to parents, and I will talk to parents tonight, I will say this, I will say that your kids have it harder than you did. I'm going to get that luck, especially from dad. It's awesome. Because I would have given myself the same luck 11 years ago. It's, yeah, uh-huh. You're, you're telling me that my son has it harder than I did when I walked up hill both ways with no shoes and snow. 
got my first car when I was 25. I had to work, pay my way through college. He's had everything he's ever wanted in his entire life. I'll see. Yeah, I know, I get that. Keep coming. What else you got, Pop? And then when he finishes, I simply do this. Dad, did you have this? No. I win. What comes with that, what comes with the internet of things, what comes with cell phones, what comes with social media, what comes with 24-7 negative, that every single thing you do is illustrated and publicized, and you know it, is nothing like what I had to go through. Those schools, you guys are seniors, right? You're going through it now. How brutal is that? Filling out these applications, putting these things together, you get a book. Northwestern University would laugh at my resume from 1979 when I was a senior in high school. Laugh. No way do I get in there. Will was 15 when he died. We didn't even talk about college. But dad went to Northwestern and mom went to Virginia and they're really high academic schools. And the University of Georgia had just come in and said, you better get A's and you better take a whole bunch of AP classes if you ever want to get into our school because there are too many applicants and not enough spots. So study more, take more AP, put 12 hours of homework every night when you only have six hours to study, all of that stuff. I never said that to Will, but society did. And they're saying it to you. And I'm telling you right now, guys and girls, it is not school, it's you. I interview people for jobs 10 times a year, been doing it for 30 years, not one time have I ever asked this question? So when you were at uh, Fairfield Ludlow, what did you get in AP Lit your junior year? <laughs> oh, a B. Oh, that's going to hurt you. <laughs> Doesn't happen. No one has ever asked me my grade point average in an interview, interview, and I have never asked anybody what their grade point average was in an interview. I look at their presence. I look how they shook my hand. Do they look me in the eyes? What's their sense of urgency going to be like? Are they going to come early? Or are they going to stay late? Are they going to take ownership of problems? What kind of team player are they? How are they going to work in a team atmosphere? That's what I'm looking for, and I cannot get that from a degree that says MIT, or Harvard, or Northwestern, or Kansas State. I just can't. Northwestern is one of the finest academic institutions in the land. Every single boss that I have ever had in my life did not go to a school that was as good as my school. Now, one of them. One looked like a savannah. You know what? Every single boss I ever had deserved to be my boss because it's not the school. It's them and it's you. And when you guys are going through these applications, and it is hard, there are not enough spots. It's a smaller world. It's a more competitive world. There's international applicants coming up. This is going to be hard. Rejection letters are going to come to you or and or your friends. And when the rejection letters come, I want you to remember me. I want you to remember this moment. It's okay. It's not a school. It's you. They're all good schools. How many examples do you want me to give? They're all good schools. It's hard. And I'm impressed with how you all navigate through it. How you all remain your sanity. How you all remain your, 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 your peace. But I'll tell you what, it's a heck of a lot easier knowing that the person sitting next to you is fighting that same battle, is going through these same challenges and obstacles. Guys, I, I stood on the mound in Fenway Park, wearing a Red Sox uniform. I can't get any higher than that. I do not make this high school's baseball team had I grown up today. Major leaguer wouldn't make a high school baseball team here. I love them. Because when I was 10, I was a dork, and I would not have made the travel team. So I would have had to change, find a new sport, because if you don't make travel team, you can't. You're done. You're done. But 1972 to 1980, there were no travel teams. The world was more patient. It allowed me to grow, allowed me to fill out, allowed me to mature, all these things. I never thought about that when I was raising Will. I think about it now. This sucks. This is really hard, guys. You still have to do it. But just know that it's hard. And know that I, I understand. And my challenge is to the adults in this room, show them that you understand. This is really hard. It's actually harder than what you went through. So we're here to help. How can we help? I wish I would have done that more when I was
was when I was coaching well, right? Oh, social. When Debbie Feeger dumped me when I was 15, and she really regrets it today. <laughs> so she's bummed. And I'm not good. When she dumped me, nobody tweeted it. My relationship status didn't change. There, there was no Snapchat. There was a, the whole world didn't know about it that much. It's a different world right now. You guys wake up knowing that you have a bad day. Pretty much everybody you've ever known will know about it by dinner. Your parents didn't have to deal with that kind of pressure. We didn't have to deal with that kind of pressure. I didn't have to deal with that kind of pressure. When people ask me what was the difference between the major leagues and the minor leagues, clear. In the minor leagues, when I was playing for the Pawtucket Red Sox, when I gave up a home run, all 407 people in the stands said, wow, that guy sucks. <laughs> when I was at Fenway Park, and I gave up a home run, all 35,000 people were, were booing me in unison, saying I suck. And every single newspaper in the country talked about it the next morning. But I was 25. You guys live that every day. I never thought about that. I, but why? This whole time I'm telling Will, isn't it great? And he's giving me that face. Isn't it great? Isn't this awesome? Isn't it great? No, Dad, it's not. And with every positive, animated word of encouragement and positive um, sentiment that I uttered, I drove him further away from me. Of course he's not going to talk to me. Because he knew what he would get. His girlfriend breaks up with him. I told him about Debbie Feeker. I told her how she regrets it today. And look at your mom. She's hot! And I made him laugh. And I said, I'm father of your word again. I'm doing good. I'm here. I'm here for him. I'm holding my wife away his tears. He told me he's going to be fine. He's going to be great. He's going to be fine. He's going to be great. He's going to be fine. I'm not fine, Dad. In fact, I'm thinking of taking my life. He never said that because he knew what he would get from me. Clueless, uneducated, and unaware response. What do you have to be depressed about? Would be my answer. Uh, I was given another chance because Will is the oldest and I've got three younger kids that I treat them in a so much different way. And I think they actually once in a while might say that, yeah, Dad kind of, kind of understands. Because Dad now says, you know what? It's actually okay to not be okay. And you all have parents that do not like it when you are not okay. They need to make you okay. They need to make you okay before you go to bed at night. They gotta make you okay. They gotta tell you the stories about their life and how they the same problem and turned out great. You gotta be okay, you gotta be okay, you gotta be okay because we love you so much we can't stand the thought of you not being okay. Sound familiar? That's me. I'm telling you now, it's okay to not be okay. And we're all on a daily basis especially now in this ridiculously crazy world that we're living in, from the pandemic to the political atmosphere to the social injustice, all of it, it's awful right now, and it's really hard to be okay. So help create, I'm challenging you all, help create a culture here in this school where it is okay to not be okay, and you're not ashamed to say, God, I'm struggling, I can use a chat. Be that kind of friend, be that kind of life teammate that encourages that. And then maybe, maybe your dad, Maybe someday you'll say, yeah, my dad gets me. I live with that one every night. Showing understanding is so important. Who best understands what it's like to be a senior right now at Ludlow High School? Your mom? Your dad? Teacher? Maybe a little more. Person sitting next to you? Your best friend? Absolutely. It's okay, encourage that. When I talk to the parents, I will be encouraging them because it's hard for them to hear that, what do you mean I'm not the one who understands them the most? It's my son, of course I understand them the most. No, you don't. You're 55 and he's 17, how the heck do you understand them? You don't. You love them the most, I'll give you that. You're there for them the most, you support them the most, but you can't understand them the most because you're not 18. You're 17, you're not going through what he went through, you never did go through what he went through. That was really, really eye-opening to me as a parent, and I challenge you teachers and, 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 and educators here to understand that. We don't have to have all the answers. The greatest piece of parenting I do now is when I say, I have no idea. I don't know, dude. I 
didn't have to do this. I never said that to Will. I always had the answer. I always knew. I was all-knowing dad. Trust the adult knows and shows that this harm. And they showed that understanding. That was interesting. Okay, so we formed this foundation. Everybody loves this message of life teammates and who are your life teammates and, and do they know? Right, here's a great homework assignment. All right, you, one, two, three, four, five. You five guys. This Saturday, you're getting married. You're getting married on Saturday. So, in the next 10 minutes, you have to say to yourself, who are my six groomsmen? You six girls. This Saturday, it's coming up, so get ready. You're getting married. Who are your six bridesmaids? Think about that a minute. Who are your groomsmen going to be? You're going to get married this weekend. Who's your groomsmen? Who are your bridesmaids? It's a great question. By the way, great dinner table question for parents. Say that to the kids. Here's the more important question. You just figured out who your bridesmaids are going to be. You just figured out who your groomsmen are going to be. Do they know it? And if not, tell them. Do these life friends of yours know that you'd want them up there to witness and be part of the most important day of your life? Do they know it? Do they know that you feel that way about them? If not, tell them. It'll increase your will to live let alone theirs. It's a really interesting concept. You guys have met your bridesmaids. You have met your groomsmen. I promise you, I guarantee you, ask your parents who was in their wedding. There will be a high school friend. I promise you that. If not, it's a very rare occasion. You have met life's greatest friends. Rejoice in it. Take advantage of it. They get you. They understand you. And they want to be there for you. That's what life teammates are about. And they see the good you don't always see. I'm going to give an example of this. We're going to have some fun with this example. I might not have fun, but you guys will. On the left, you're going to see me pitching back in 1988, playing the Oakland A's, who were really good. And three and one, the Two of their best players, Jose Canseco was on second, and the league leading home run hitter, Mark McGuire. Who's heard of Mark McGuire? No one could really come up with anything. They could hold this thing. We could have Rice and Lynn coming together. Until that pitch, I had been doing very well. The announcer just said, oh my goodness. Go ahead, Steve. Before steroids. It was before steroids, so I can't even blame that. Okay. First of all, I just want to know that I hate Mark McGuire. <laughs> Secondly, the ball went over the green monster. The ball went over the netting, 50 foot of netting above the green monster. The ball went over Lansdowne Street on the other side of the green monster. The ball went over the bars on the other side of Lansdowne Street. And it landed, it's rumored, if it ever did land, it landed somewhere on the Massachusetts Turnpike. <laughs> Guys, you have the honor of looking at and listening to the guy who gave up the longest home run in the history of Fenway Park. That sucked. There was nothing good about that. There was no positive in that. There was, there was always something good. Yeah, no, nothing good. ESPN played the game. It was on every, uh, they just never stopped showing it. My friends were calling me up. How's your neck? You know, boom, 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 boom. It was brutal. It was brutal. One of Ab's and, and Steve's and my teammates from Northwestern, a guy named Paul Tickey, who I actually grew up with, I had left tickets that night for his big brother, who was like my big brother. I, you know, I was 10 years old, he was pitching wiffle ball to me. I'll take it, love this guy. I had left tickets for him and three of his colleagues. He was in Boston on business. And the next day, we went to lunch. And I'm thinking, I'm done. I'm being sent back down to the minors. And the difference between the majors and the minors is really a lot. Like, it's really a lot. And I didn't want to go back down to the minors. I was so upset, I was just, I was miserable. And just so negative, and he sees me at the lunch, and I didn't want to be there. And Al just get, he started getting mad. He goes, John, I know you're upset, but can I ask you a question? I'm like, yeah. He said, is it safe to say that at some point in your life, you had a dream that someday you would strike somebody out in the major leagues? I'm like, 
because you heard me. I said, yeah. John, you did that last night. I was in the stands, and I saw my little brother's very, very best friend, who I used to throw pitches to in the backyard when he was 12. I saw him wearing a Boston Red Sox uniform, standing on Fenway Park. And I saw him get his, not only his first major league strikeout, but also his second major league strikeout. He said, Trout, I was so happy for you. I was so thrilled that you were, you were able to have this special moment that most people in life don't get. I was teared, I was crying tears in my eyes, and his colleagues were like, yeah, he was crying, it was really embarrassing, right? And he was just so emotional when, when he was giving me the story, he kept saying, I was so happy for you. You know what I said to him? Wait, I did? I was so obsessed with the negative in my life. I'm sorry. I was so obsessed with, with the bad. I totally totally missed the good. And sure enough, I went back to the locker room after lunch. The catcher can catch the I got the video. The better you went to the video room and I put the tape into in. The strike zone and I'm like, into the strike zone. The oh my gosh, I did. Obviously, the more you have to reach to get to it. Strike three. Not only did I strike out Stan Javier, I struck out Dave Henderson too. He's a pretty good player. And I just remember how do I miss that? How do you miss your first base on strike? I should have had that ball. It should be on a, on a wall in my house. Stan Javier, his dad, Julian Javier, was on my glove. It was the autograph on my glove when I was a kid. There's a lot of fun stuff about this. Sometimes it takes a friend because we can't see how green the grass is or we can't see how green the grass could be or can be. Sometimes it takes a friend. You all have friends who are thinking about the negative, who can't see that positive. You have friends that are struggling. I guarantee you this. It's one in five. It's okay. So encourage that atmosphere where those friends can talk about it, can have these conversations, and it gives you the opportunity to show hope, to show positive. And it went even further, as I dissected a little bit further, the pitch on the left is the home run to McGuire, right down the middle, about belt high, you baseball and pitchers in the room, you, you're shuddering right now because of all in the 9,000 feet. It's my way of saying, Merry Christmas, Mark. Here you go, boom. On the right, you see the pitch, it's lower, it's outside, it's hard to hit, it's a sinker, it's moving. And I remember that night, when I got to this park, my pitching coach said, Trout line, don't throw the ball down the middle to Mark McGuire. Thanks, Coach. But Wes Gardner, one of our pitchers in the bullpen, one of my teammates, he says to me, Chuck, what was that? What was that pitch you threw, Javier? I said, I was a two-seamer, a sinker. He's like, dude, your ball moves more than any pitcher we got. That's you, dude. That's the pitch that got you there. That's the pitch you should be throwing. You should never be throwing a four-seam. Just your ball moves, go with it. That's coaching. What is it that we do well, and how can we do it a little bit more often? What is it that we love to do, and how can we get it more into our daily lives? And it was really interesting to me, because if you look at me right now, you're seeing a guy who's pretty motivated right now, who's having fun, who's good at this. You're not saying to yourself, oh, I feel so bad for this guy. He lost his son 10 years ago. You're seeing a guy who's got a bounce in his step. I'm making me laugh. I'm having fun with this. And of course, I cry every day. But you know what? Right now, I am into this, and I'm having fun, and I'm good at it, and I know it's for the greater good of others, and it's putting me in this positive passion. So think about that. I'm in sales. I should be out talking to people. I should be building relationships. I'm good at that. I'm a people guy. Why am I sitting behind my desk looking at a spreadsheet? Why am I analyzing a report? Okay, I can do that, but that's not why I'm here. So I challenge you guys to think about this. You're seniors. It's time. Look in the mirror. What do I love to do? What am I good at? What's my summer job going to be? What do I love to do? What am I good at? What's my major going to be? Think that through. It's really interesting because it changed my life. I decided right then and there, this is 
like seven years ago, that I am not going to sit behind my desk that much anymore. I have to go visit my customers. I have to go talk to my employees. I'm going to be a relationship guy. I'm going to find other people that love looking at spreadsheets. That's their core competency or their unique ability. And if you guys don't know what it is that you do really well, ask your friends. And really listen to them. Because they know. They know. Listen to them. It's a great conversation. And it's a great way to put that strategy together as you try to navigate the next few years, which are going to be important, but also a lot of fun. Interesting how my life changed in this way as a result of Will's life and, and Will's passing. People ask me, what do I do differently now? And I say, I'm a, I'm a little bit more into, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot more into the now than I ever was. Now, I had to be that way because it was so devastating. So I looked for those little things, right? Those little things that, that, that this community has done for, for Jen and Krista. The little singles, the little base hits, the little good blocks, the little good passes. You can't be waiting for home runs all the time, guys. Look for those little good things that happen every day. The thousand smiles that you do have. Remember them. Rejoice in them. Make sure your friends are noticing them. Don't let them miss their first strikeout. Be that friend that shows them the good. That's so important. And it's such a great, great opportunity for you guys to, to improve culture in this school and in your community. That student up there is a good student. If I had that report card, my dad would have said, don't even come home with a C. Just don't bother coming home. That was 1979. It was a different world back then. That kid's a great student. What's happening in that class where he's getting a C? Or what's happening in the classes he's getting an A that's not happening in the class where he's getting a C? How can we take what's good in the A class and apply it to the C? Why does this customer love us? Yet that customer doesn't love us. Oh, we make mistakes with that customer. No, no, we make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Maybe it's the way that we handle the mistakes. Maybe it's the way we prepare the mistakes. Maybe it's the way we communicate. Maybe whatever it is that causes Why don't we ask them why they love us? And bottle that and apply it to the next customer who might not. All this changed my approach to things. And it was a positive thing. You guys do so many things well. So many things well. Don't forget the base hits. Don't forget the good things. Wes Gardner told me to, to, to throw more. He didn't say, don't throw it down the middle. He told me what I should do. Throw more of the sinker. That's you, Trump. That's your pitch. Do it. And it helped me, and it motivated me, and it was a positive way. And I look at this concept of a positive passion, and I look at that picture on the right. I'm going to be speaking to all the athletic directors in the state of Connecticut tomorrow. I'm going to show them that picture, and I'm going to say, what's that coach doing right now? He's probably saying something like, hey, you look really good out there in uniform today, and they're pleased with the way you're playing. Good job. Maybe you and I you know, can go get coffee wrong. I had over 200 coaches in my life from Little League all the way through the Big Leagues. Seven of them get Christmas cards from me. And I, I remember speaking to a bunch of coaches and I, and I did this research and I thought, okay, wh what's different about those seven that, that causes me to want to give them a, a Christmas card? And I realized what it was. They all gave me that look. They all got in my face and told me how bad I was. They told me when I was, when I was wrong, and they screamed at me and dropped F-bombs on me and all that stuff. But when I did well, they also gave me that face. They'd get right up and say, Joe, I was a great job. You finally did what we're talking about. Keep it going. You can do this. f -bomb. Spitting on me and swearing at me. You all right? <laughs> right? Positive passion. Those are the coaches that run through the wall for when they were kind of excited when I did well, they were telling me, I care about you. They were giving me a love you, man. And it made me want to do better. And those were those coaches. Those were those teachers. Those were those principals. Those were those ministers that when I came back from college over Thanksgiving, I wanted to go say hi. I wanted them to know that I cared about them and I was trying to make them proud. And I appreciated that they cared about me. So you teachers here, are those kids coming back for you at Thanksgiving? Are they coming to see you and say, hey, great to see you, I'm doing well. How are you doing? 
because you inspired them in such a way. And it's perfectly okay to give them that face, and it's perfectly okay to, be, to, be, to get after them when they make mistakes. But don't save all your passion for the negative. Throw some positive in there, because we all need it. And never in life have we needed more positivity than we do in this crazy world today, because the pandemic is trying its heart out to take positive away from our day. The past year and a half, the past two years, have been like, unlike any other. You guys lost a year of high school. Only four. Greatest years of your life, high school. One, 25% of it ripped away. That's hard, guys. This is hard. The isolation, the effect of the pandemic on mental health and mental wellness is, is, is it's immeasurable. I now get asked, I'm, I'm used to speaking to kids, I now get asked to speak to, to, to corporations and companies because they're stuck in conference, instead of being in conference rooms with their buddies where they can walk out together and say, boy, that meeting sucked, or boy, this was great, or what are we doing tonight, and this and that. They're in a room and they hit leave. Oof. They're alone. The human spirit craves companionship. That's why it's so much better that you guys are back here in school and that companionship can flourish and you can take advantage of the relationships that you have, and you have this opportunity to be there and, and help your friends find that positive passion. And to do that, guys, you still have to think about yourselves. I'm going to fly home tomorrow night, and they're going to say, in the unlikely event, the oxygen mask is going to come, put your mask on first. Give yourself some me time. This is hard. Life will get in the way. Don't let it. Book your me time, your me time. Book your Kevin time. Book your gym time. I still do it. I still do it. And it's so important for you guys to remember this. When the, when the, when the pandemic hit and the foundation couldn't do very much, I said, okay, maybe I can use social media and I'll take this message and I'm gonna come up with 100 days of hope and for 100 straight days, they never missed a day, I came up with something like that and I posted it on Instagram and Facebook and the various social media, giving this message of hope and love and being there for each other. When the 100 days were up, I stopped doing it. And all of a sudden, I was like, not as happy. My days were a little bit different and the one difference was I didn't have that half an hour every day where I was not thinking about work, I was not thinking about school, I was not thinking about the challenges and obstacles that lay ahead. I was simply thinking about something that I was passionate about, something that I believed in. So give yourself that me time. It's important. And in today's crazy world, sometimes you have to book it. I'm going to go for a walk every morning from 6.30 to 7.30. Done. It's me time. I cry. I, I, I think to myself, I, I, I just sometimes listen to music, sometimes don't listen to music, whatever it might be. But it's my time, and it kind of resets me. Don't underestimate that. Don't underestimate when you go to college next year the need for that, because you're going to be hit with lots of things that are different. There's more pressure, there's more school, there's more homework. Give yourself some me time to help you get through. And encourage your friends to do the same, because each day starts anew. My dad always used to say, the sun's going to come up tomorrow. So what's different about me is I, I try to live a good life one day at a time. I want to have a good life today. That's where I'm going to start working. I don't have a good life tomorrow. And it's the little things that do that. But what's really interesting about that is when I think to myself, what, 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 is, what is my passion? What do I want to do? And if I, can, if I can do for the greater good of others, if I can help a friend, if I can be that teammate that I'm asking you guys to be, it simply makes me feel better. And I challenge you guys to be thinking that through. You know, as I look at, look at Jim and Kristen here, and I think about you know, the Cusco family, I remember this quote that was given to me shortly after my son passed. Life is 10% of what happens and 90% of how you react to it. And what Jim and Kristen are doing, they're living in that 90. And it's not easy. And they're trying to, to make sure that, that Kevin's afterglow, right, keeps shining. And they do it in a positive way. And it's so impressive, and I'm so proud of them. And I'm so, I know it's going to be hard, but I also know it's going to be so rewarding when you do this. But give yourself the 10. It's not 
199. That's 1090, Jim. You'll hear me saying this to you. I'm going to call you up. I'm going to say, dude, 1090. Right? Because I know you and you're going crazy. And it's awesome. Give yourself the 10. Because it's okay to not be okay. So 10% of the day is 2.4 hours. That's a decent amount of time to just be okay. I'm, not, I'm going to just sit down and think of it. It's very interesting. Help each other with that. Help each other with that 1090. How am I going to react to this? Each day is a new day and it starts that way. You all have an opportunity here to do something different today. You all have friends that aren't doing great. They need you. You need them. Have that kind of chat. Don't make this what I love about coming I'm back here after two years. Because when we talked about this message, this community said, yeah, this is good. And they started doing things. They started creating things. And they, they did things with, without me for the good of others. Because life is hard. And sometimes you need a friend to get you through it. Think of that positive passion. Think about what it is that you enjoy doing most. And how can I get that into my life? How can I incorporate that into my job? How can I incorporate that into my major, into my career, right? You have parents that love you and, and are there for you, and they're just like me, and they're just like I was. They can't stand to see you not okay. So talk to them about it. We were talking at lunch. I had a lady, um, a, 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 a lady whose son I, I coached. I had breakfast with her. She said that her daughter, who was a senior in high school, said, you know what's the worst part of my day, Mom? Knowing that I'm going to come home and you're going to ask me, how was your day? So I asked my kids, how was your day? <laughs> How's practice? <laughs> what did the coach say? <laughs> so when's your next game? <laughs> I get nothing. Their day sucks. They're in school. They don't want to talk about their day. Let's talk about something else. And this is what I'm going to say to your parents when, they're, when I see them tomorrow night. Tonight, thanks. They just show me, they just point me where to go, and I go. But I want you guys to understand that. There is no book on parenting. We just love you. We don't like to see you not okay, but we, don't, we just don't know, so help us. And when they ask me, how's your day? I say, you know, look, can we talk about your day? Let's talk about your day. Let's, let's think about your day, Mom. Right? Tell me about your birthday bridal party, Mom. Why'd you pick that? Do something different, right? And that's... That's the kind of conversation you guys want to have. Because you don't want to talk about how did, how did the literature class go today, do you? Right? I mean, it's, it's, but we parents are thinking, so how's your day? It's good. We're trying to be, we're trying to be great parents. We're showing that we care. We want to hear about you. We want to know more about you. Will, but I should have said, Will, what really pissed you off today? Hit me with it. Oh, they'll tell me that. Right? Something else that encourages conversation. This is what's so important. The human spirit craves companionship, and it's two ways. So help your folks, right? Help the adults in your life by encouraging them to create this, create this culture of communication. When I first talked to, to Jim, I said, Jim, the best advice I could give you is advice that was given to me. Love is what heals. Time doesn't heal. So surround yourself with love. And go where the love is. As often as you can, guys, go where the love is. Sometimes you have to bring the love. And I know that can be uncomfortable, and that can be a little bit embarrassing to, you know, to tell you guys to start saying I love you more often. So I made it easy for you. And, and let's, let's do it in a way that we have some fun with it. Drop a love you man on a friend. What did I do with my Let me see what I do with my clicker. <laughs> Drop a love you man on a friend. You'll feel better. Text the love you man to somebody today. Start right here in this room. I want everybody in this room, right now, in honor of your friends, in honor of how hard it is to be a teenager today, be a high school senior today, I want everybody in this room to turn to the person next to you and say, I love you, man. Yeah.
happens every single time. Guys, all I asked was for you to turn to the person next to you and say, oh, man, you're hugging it, and I'm kissing it, and I'm like, but you know what? It was flipping awesome, and there was an energy around this room that was unlike any energy that you saw today, because you dropped a love you man on a friend. I know, it's silly, and it's corny. Do it again. Do it tonight. Do it tomorrow. Drop a few more loving hands into your life and watch the difference. Because I tell you what, man, we, can, we all need it. We really do. You with me? Love you. <laughs> all right, kids. Oh, gosh. I got like seven more of these speeches to do in the next 24 hours. All right. Take away. It's hard. It's fun doing it together. Have a little bit more fun. Bring the fun with your friends. Be that kind of friend that's there. Make sure your friends know that you care. Make sure they know that you love them. And I don't care if you're wearing a Yankee hat. I'm a little disappointed with the Yankee hat. I'm just, just going to say it. I love you, though. Be there for them. Create this culture here at Love Bell that says it's okay. I love you guys, and I've had fun today, so thank you all very much, and come down. So we have a couple of minutes, if anybody would like to ask uh, Mr. Shawwine a question, we can, uh, we can do that. Or do if you want to share a story or something related? What resonated with you? What were some of the points that you heard today that you think really hit home? Don't throw a fastball down the middle of the barbed wire. <laughs> that ball went far. But the strikeout was amazing. Thanks. Great, great move. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, there's a lot to take in, and uh, we are so grateful. Mr. and Mrs. Cutso, thank you so much for joining us today. Mr. Trawin, it was just absolutely amazing, um, the story that you've shared. Um, we're so sorry for your losses, but at the same time, we are inspired by you. We're so grateful for the message that you bring us. Um, one big round of applause, everybody. Let's do it. Uh, you have 10 more minutes or so. Seniors, you are excused for the day. Thank you.